Transparency. I've never played Fallout, but boy, has this show gotten me interested in the world. And I'm very proud of how this breakdown has turned out. I'm so glad I did it. I wasn't going to maybe do the breakdown. I think the binge drop was a mistake. Now that we're on the other side of it, while it was really exciting to see Fallout trend uh, on uh, Wednesday night when it dropped, uh, tw like 24 hours early or something, but still, they dropped it early, and it was really rewarding to see people get so excited about it when it, when it debuted. But that conversation has totally faded away as people start to watch it now at their own pace, uh, and so people aren't on the same page like they would be if the show came out weekly. So... That was a mistake. It's too bad. How are you enjoying it? How, how have you consumed it? Uh, some of you might not have finished still. Uh, but I hope that when you do finish season one, you do watch this full breakdown because, you know, so there was, so like everybody wasn't on the same page. Uh, the, the interest was, you know, not as strong as I'd hoped in the show. But I was like, yeah, let me look into a few things. And the more I did, I was like, I got to do the breakdown. I got to do it. And again, I'm very happy with how it turned out. Even though, again, I've never played the game. Uh, I think my, my research, uh, you know, uh, is thorough. And, you know, again, sheds a lot of light on season one. And also where season two is uh, likely going to, to, to go. You know, I'm, I'm going to help you see the opportunities and the possibilities of season two. Which I'm excited about. Never even played New Vegas. New Vegas trended... Two things trended a little bit after the first, I'd say, 12 hours after the show dropped. Brotherhood of Steel, I saw trending a little bit, and New Vegas, which is very cool. Um, but yeah, what do you think? Will you think the binge was a mistake? I mean, are, I mean, now again, now that you're, you've experienced it, was it worth it to you to be able to watch all of it as much as you wanted it the way you want and, and not have that fan conversation take place? I'm wearing Fallout Vault Blue. It's as close as I could get. Uh, I, I, again, I really had a fun time with this show. All right, so what really happened in Fallout Season 1? My favorite scene in terms of the show having something to say is in Episode 6, where Matt Berry, what a voice, uh, from What We Do in the Shadows is playing actor Sebastian Leslie. Oh, I love it. And he says that technology is taking over the world. Ah, oh, like it is in real life. Even Hollywood, hilariously, he says that Robco got the rights to his voice for their Mr. Handy robot by buying the studio. Sound familiar with all uh, these acquisitions and mergers? That's just really interesting stuff. And they didn't have to pay him too much as a result. And then when he see, then he says that the future is products. This was a very powerful line. He says, you're a product, I'm a product, the end of the world is a product and he doesn't know how right he is because when you're in the end of the world business like vault tech is forget peace talks you launch the nukes yourself to ensure a market for your product which is exactly what happened we discover yes at the end of the day fallout is about capitalism and you know i i appreciate capitalism but i do agree that it's run amok we've got some serious problems and i think this show does a wonderful job addressing them and ironically, Bethesda Games, itself, of course, of course, a company that makes Fallout, gave Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy a directive not to adapt any of the actual games, but instead to tell a new independent story, I guess, in their own space. And they found one! Because this season one story takes place, you know, the current times, in 2296, which is later than any of the Fallout games to date. With Nolan and Joy having Vault Tech's Hank McLean nuke effectively the new California Republic by taking its capital, Shady Sands, off the map. These are huge factors in the game. So the fact that this show was allowed to dis dispense them, you know, get rid of them, that's pretty amazing that Bethesda let them do that. Uh, so, you know, he basically nuked Shady Sands in a nasty custody battle. No, no, no. The reality, and this is also it's fascinating, is that he felt that Shady Sands was a competing product. Ah! I mean, sure, he had some personal stuff invested, but that's really what it was. Why would anyone want to live in a vault when they could go live in Shady Sands? So he got rid of the competition, even if it meant turning his wife, who had left him and taken the kids, into a ghoul. Heck, for Hank, that was probably a bonus. 
I don't know why she looks so bad compared to uh, Walton Goggins' Cooper Howard. Like, couldn't, couldn't Lee get her some, some chems? All right, but let's back things up to the beginning, 2077, which is basically Cooper Howard's flashbacks, right? Right before all the bombs went off at the beginning of the show. What a sequence, as good as T2 when it comes to nuclear imagery. All right, so the war that he served in before becoming a movie star, I believe were the resource wars, which is an extension of concerns that we have today. The planet has limited resources. Uh, and in the game, largely that was about energy. Everybody was fighting over energy. And some would say a lot of the wars even so far recently have been about energy. But when you think about it, there are a lot of resources we could find ourselves fighting about someday. Water, food, and fascinatingly, even the metals that are crucial to making our smartphones that we've become so dependent on. Let's see where that takes us in the future, for reals. But again, in the game, Fallout, it was largely over energy. And Cooper Howard fought in that war, where he wore an earlier version of the armor that Maximus wears uh, the, by the Brotherhood. And that was manufactured by West Tech, where Bud Askins used to work before coming to Vault Tech. Uh, I love that uh, you have this, uh, this interchangeability between the companies, because they're all basically the same thing, uh, which we're going to discuss. But that's why Cooper hates Bud so much when he meets him, because the suit was faulty and led to a lot of his fellow soldiers being killed. But Cooper Howard exploits that fault, those faults in the final episode when he has to take on the Brotherhood, which was a great, a great payoff. So Lee Moldover is a scientist who was working at that time to create cold fusion, AKA limitless energy. But what co company wants limitless energy on the free market? So vault it turns out, bought up her work and took it away from her. So she formed an anti-capitalist underground movement similar to the communist movement in Hollywood in the 1940s and 50s that led, of course, to McCarthyism. So Hollywood government and business have always been in the mix together. I love this stuff. Actors have been popular figures either used to sway public opinion by companies, like how vault Tech uses Cooper Howard as a spokesperson, but actors, of course, have also used themselves to try and affect social change. You see that reflected in the show Well, we hear about it, not only those attending Lee's meetings, but some of Cooper Howard's fellow actors refused to work with him after he became a spokesperson for vault Tech. Heck, John Wilkes Booth, a famous actor, used his celebrity to facilitate the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Watch Manhunt on Apple TV. You'll see that he probably would not have been able to have been successful as an assassin if it weren't for his celebrity, which is amazing. It's fascinating. And in Fallout, as we just said, Rob Coe buys the rights to a studio to get the rights to the voices of popular actors to help sell their product. In fact, one of the last shots of season one is the Hollywood sign as a product sponsored by Nuka-Cola. I mean, that just tells you what the show is really about. Uh, you could say, uh, you could also say that the Enclave in Fallout, the game, a group of political, military, and corporate figures that run the world post-apocalypse, they're first born in episode eight of season one. Strange love style. I I'm sure you all picked up on that nod. But uh, vault Tech brings together its competitors for pretty much a corporate takeover of the world. They're like, you know, we've been going through government up until this point, but let's just, let's just take control of this ourselves. So at this meeting is vault Tech, which makes the vaults and is eventually behind Cold Fusion. Robco, primarily behind robots, some of which you saw like Mr. Handy in season one, but also New Vegas. Robco is uh, run by New Vegas, teased at the end of the show, and we'll talk about New Vegas and Robco more in a bit. Uh, West Tech, a military defense contractor that makes things like the power armor that you see used uh, uh, by the Brotherhood in season one. Repcon, which does aerospace and alternate energy based in Nevada, probably near New Vegas. And then Big MT, another defense contractor. So while you're watching Fallout at first, it seems that what's left of the New California Republic, the Brotherhood of Steel and the Vaults, are fighting for control of this post-apocalyptic world. But the big reveal at the end of the season is that it's not only these corporations who are actually in control from behind the scenes, but they created this post-apocalyptic world because it was the best way to sell their products. Because look at what they specialize in. You know, again, robots, uh, uh, you know, uh, nuclear vaults to live in, uh, defense contractors. I mean, it's just really, really interesting. So in season one, 
The focus is primarily on vault with most of our characters spinning out of that company. And I do think that going forward, they're going to focus on different companies like Robco. All right, but we're still focused on what happened in season one. And we learned that Cooper Howard's wife, Barb, who works for vault Tech, wanted to get them into a good vault. Because we do learn that a lot of the vaults, like Vault 4, are actually opportunities for these companies to experiment, to create more product, right? Test groups, as they like to say. But Vault 31 is the good vault. That's the Vault Tech vault, where all of manage was, management was put in cryosleep, specifically Barb Howard's team. And 200 plus years later, they've been woken up to breed within vaults 32 and 33 to keep management going, all overseen by Bud, who's now just a brain, still basically running his management tra trainee programming program. You know, we saw him talking about that and, you know, when he was, a, when he was still a human, uh, you know, to, to Cooper saying, to Cooper Howard saying, you know, it's, you know, the, 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 what the real, the most powerful thing is time, being able to wait everything out. And he said, if only I could train executives forever. And he got his wish. Betty Pearson and Hank McLean were Barb Howard's executive assistants, which is, of course, of course, is one of the big reveals at the end. Frozen for almost 200 years before being woken up to start families, uh, at least Hank did, and to run these select vaults. That's how they're still alive after all this time. Cooper Howard is still alive because he was turned into a ghoul, like we see Thaddeus be turned into. That was amazing. And if a ghoul can keep getting chems, well, they seemingly can stay alive forever. Uh, how great was it, by the way, when that guy just sat there and let Cooper Howard sew his trigger finger back on? I was like, you idiot, he's sewing back his trigger finger. He's going to sh- And he did. It was great. And at the end of Fallout, we find out that just like Lucy, Cooper Howard is looking for his family. Where is Barb? Where's his daughter, Janie? If Betty and Hank are still alive, that may, then maybe, likely, Barb and Janie are too. Maybe they were in cryosleep. Maybe they're ghouls. But there are other options we'll discover because uh, you'll see that the head of Robco, Robert House, who we see briefly here, is still alive and running New Vegas. At first, he presents himself as AI, Tony Stark style, but eventually in that game, he's discovered to look a little bit more like a, dif a different Disney property, the Emperor. But still alive, is Barb gonna look like this? But here's a question that Fallout Season 1 never answers. How is Lee Moldover still alive after 200 years and looking so good? Having gone from running her underground anti-capitalism group to basically being the leader, it seems, of the New California Republic before Hank nuked it? How'd she survive that? But she doesn't survive season one. She dies at the end, but maybe her longevity is the key to Barb's and maybe also Janie's. She do, uh, uh, Lee literally does turn the power back on before she dies, and we'll see if that stays an open resource or gets turned into a product in season two. Now, now that Hank's past and motivations have been revealed, that he's basically an evil salesman and his kids are at best a way to keep management going and at worst showroom floor samples, he runs off in the power armor and flees to New Vegas to Robert House of Robco. That, the Lucky 38 Casino, this tower you see here, is his base of operations with Robco Securitron seen in the closing credits. And maybe also the leadership of the Enclave, or at least the corporate side of it maybe, is based in New Vegas as well. As I said, you know, Repcon uh, does, is supposed to be based in this area. While it's not made totally clear in season one, some have theorized that Siji Wilzig was working for the Enclave. Uh, note the different uniforms at this facility before he defected to bring Moldover her cold fusion back. So for season two of Fallout, obviously a big part of the story will be finding out what happened to Barb Howard and Janie Howard. What shape are they in? And who was the shadowy figure that Barb was taking directives from during that fateful meeting? Also, is Lucy destined to follow in her mother's footsteps and become a disruptor? And will her brother join her? Or will he join management? He kind of already has. He does seem to have a connection, for better or worse, with Betty. They get each other. And he is acting a little bit like management already. I think that's great. Can Robert House help Hank McLean? And for what reason would he? What products will motivate season two as we move away from the vault and again more to, towards robotics and military contractors? In New Vegas, the game, a very popular game, they focused on the platinum chip uh, created by Robert House before the nuclear explosions of 2077 that they set off. But the chip was lost in the aftermath. And, you know, a lot of New Vegas, the game is 
trying to get that chip to the, you know, as, a, as the player, you decide who you give it to. But it was, uh, it was basically a serious technological upgrade, and it also had important information on it and the ability to access military systems. So pl the platinum chip, remember it. The new Vegas game also focused a lot on the Hoover Dam, as whoever controls it has a supply of clean water and power. In the game, the new California Republic, which is, was still alive at that point, Robert House and Caesar's Legion are all fighting for control of the Hoover Dam. Now, obviously, in Fallout the Show, the new California Republic is no, no longer on the board. And we also have a different source of power called Fusion, so maybe they'll mix those storylines up a little bit, you know, fighting instead of over the Hoover Dam for this cold fusion chip. Caesar's Legion could be interesting because, of course, now we all know that dudes think about the Roman Empire all the time. And here, it's recreated. It seems a little like the Brotherhood to me, but, you know, we'll see. The game has it as an ultra-conservative dictatorship with slaves, but we'll see what Nolan and Joy do with it. I think they could do something a little bit more inventive. However, New Vegas also allows the show to take on the 1960s version of Vegas. Ah, just like they focus so much on Hollywood in season one. And that, you know, also in the 1960s and even today, a lot of movies also focus on, uh, 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 movies and TV shows focus on Vegas. So Vegas, the 1960s, not only had a connection to Hollywood, uh, and again, as I said, Hollywood and Vegas are still very much connected to this day. Uh, they're very close in proximity. You know, there's a lot of headliners there. A lot of people like to escape there. Love it. Um, but also, of course, another big part of Vegas in the 1960s in particular was gangsters. You've seen the Godfather franchise, right? And sure enough, in the new Vegas game, Robert House brings together the three families, the chairman, the Omertas, and the White Glove Society. This sounds so great. Who all run their own casinos within New Vegas. There's also a rogue group of Vegas impersonators which sounds a lot of, like a lot of fun. They're, they're, they respect Robert House, but they don't directly work for him. And what is Vegas but a city that has a lot of different types of product to sell, including people? Oh, that's really fascinating. So I think this is going to allow them to build on a lot of the commentary in season one, but also at the same time, take it in a new direction. But it is still connected to season one. So that's what's, that, that's what's really happened in uh, Fallout season one, and that's how the stage has been set for Fallout Season 2. What do you think? Both if you're new to the world of Fallout or if you play, you've play, played the games, what are your thoughts and what would you like to add to this conversation? Share those thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.